I am a part-time magician. Are those back alone from that? Would you like to see a magic trick? I have an announcement to make. One of our students, Finney Blake, was abducted. What if I could help the police find Finney? Since I was a kid. I'll scream. I'll scratch your face. This face? Daddy, I had a dream about it. What happened in your dream? He was taken. By a man with black balloons? Yes. We never released those details. guys and welcome back to a, another schlock and or quickie review as always i'm lindsay wilkins and this time around we're going to be looking at scott derrickson's derrickson's don't know why i can't say that name scott derrickson's latest movie the black phone the one he made instead of dr strange 2 uh this movie stars ethan hawke mason thames madeline mcgrath jeremy davis and my boy, James Ranson. Uh, it's out in theatres in Australia about the 21st, 22nd, as well as the UK. And it's already in theatres in the US. The Black Phone is an adaption of a Joe Hill story. And watching the movie, you can see Daddy King's DNA all through it. Psychotic child murderers who uses magic tricks and black balloons that fly through the air to catch his prey. Uh, children in some serious danger uh, who would also qualify as having the shine as well as some really over-the-top violent bullies. Um, yeah, Joe Hill definitely learned from, from his father in a lot of, in many ways of storytelling. And, of course, so yes, The Black Phone is very much my jam. Uh, it is very dark. It is very darkly funny. It's got some of my favourite actors in it. We'll get to Ethan Hawke and James Ranson in a moment. Yeah, there was a chance I was always going to like this movie. But at the same time, this is very... A very much a Scott Derrickson movie, who I'm still kind of warming up to. To be honest, Sinister scared the living ever snot out of me, uh, and I'm still not the biggest fan of the original Doctor Strange, though I think watching the second one with all its amazing raininess that I did love in it, I just don't think I like Benedict Cumberbatch as Doctor Strange. I, I just don't have a, I don't get excited. Um, but anyway, we're not talking about those. We are talking about the black phone. And the black phone, as I said before, is very Scott Derrickson. It's a very much his joint. There is a bleakness and a darkness that permeates every pore of this movie. Uh, I love the opening, uh, which starts with an all-American baseball game, and then the credit uh, then the credit starts, and we descend into Derrickson's eight millimeter creepy world. And we go from a baseball game to missing children's posters across every single building and kids literally beating the snot out of each other. Derrickson World is a bleak one. It is where violence begets more violence. Uh, to the point where Ethan Hawke's grabber kind of feels like a normal part of this constructed world. And we'll get into how violence plays a really important part in this in this movie but first at the heart of at the heart of it the black phone is a survival story uh mason tim's finney is stuck in a basement and is matched against hawk's masked grabber who just likes to come into the basement just to stare at finney you know normal absolutely normal behavior and then of course there's the hook of this movie uh, which is, if you've seen the trailer, which I usually play before these, is going to get into it. There's an unhooked phone in this basement prison that constantly rings. And voices from the grave are, con are giving Finney advice on how to maybe, possibly, survive the situation that he finds himself in. It's a really great hook. I mean, as soon as I heard about it, dead phone giving with ghosts talking to said person, I was just like, yes, yes, please. And that is what... That is what this movie is, but at the same time, it's kind of just a hook. There is so much going on. 
Scott Derrickson really shoots the hell out of this basement. Uh, it's a room. He uses the space really well. You never, even though Finney is com confined and locked in this space, you never kind of feel confined as an audience member or to the point where you're like seeing the same stuff over and over again. It's a room full of ghosts and terrifying horrors. And young Mason really applies himself well and he gives an amazing performance and, the, and he, he is able to carry a lot of this movie on his very thin shoulders. But of course he's not alone in this heavy lifting. No, yes, as I mentioned, as I read up the cast, uh, this cast rules. Um, but not only that do you have uh, Mason Thames, you also have Melon McGraw, who is, well, she seems to steals every scene she's in and who can say, fuck you, Jesus, like any other pro. Uh, she is kind of actually surprisingly more the audience surrogate, um, more than Finney, because she is the one who is searching for Finney. Uh, she is the one that is kind of giving you more context into actual rules and how this world works. Um, and she's, I don't know, she's probably the most likable out of everyone as well, even though she is the most sweary and probably the most violent out of everyone. And everyone is very violent in this movie. She's also the um, one that has the most uh, ingenuity as well as blunt force. She understands how the rules of the world work and is able to pretty much work around them, fuck with them whenever she needs to get anything done. Um, and she's really good at getting people to listen to her. Uh, she has one dream and the cops that instantly go, you're our sidekick to solve this uh, case of missing children. Uh, I really love her, but you believe how that would be the case. Uh, again, you believe we're in a Stephen King world, so there are psychic children running around and everyone appears to know this. I mean, there's one moment she just comes out of nowhere, swinging a rock at a bully and pretty much just leaps at them. It's a really fantastic moment. And... It brings a bit of levity to the violence when all the violence in this movie is really horrific. But of course, then there's the rest of the supporting cast. Uh, you have Jeremy Davis, who I didn't actually realize he was in this movie until afterward, even though he is sporting a more extreme version of his uh, 2002 secretary here. It's a truly amazing mullet. I, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, it's one of the reasons why you should go see this movie, to be honest. It's just Jeremy Davis's mullet. And I was truly giddy when I realized that James, uh, my boy, James Ranson was in this uh, movie playing a coked up idiot. Uh, Ranson's whoa, face is the best thing ever. And he deploys it so well. Uh, Valley of Violence, It Chapter 2, um, even a few moments in Tangerine. I, it's, it's goddamn fantastic. Um, just please give him more work because he's just always a delight on screen. But of course, then there's Ethan Hawke. I mean, when hasn't he been great on film, even in not good movies? He really does well with a truly evil character. And he manages to, manages to play a child serial killer with this weird touch of vulnerability that he is able just to bring to his character. I think it's actually, I think a little bit of it is written in there because you see, as we get into this very specific pattern of violence, which I keep hinting at, not that big of a reveal actually it's just what I kept thinking when I was watching the movie but it's well there in um within his performance you can see that he's scared that he's worried he doesn't always know exactly what needs what he has to do when a situation doesn't go according to plan uh, but he's truly a terrifying and dangerous character but with all the supernatural elements and really amazing tense set piece sent tense set pieces uh, sorry um, that always go in a slightly different direction than you expect. This is a kind of thing I love about it is that the movie, you know how the movie's going to play out, but you don't know the pieces how they're going to play out. And those pieces are truly what make this make this movie really good. But as I was sitting there watching it, jumping at all the places that scared me, Scott Derrickson made me want to jump. I couldn't help but think of how the violence really kind of fits in and what he's actually what Scott Derrickson is actually really trying to say with the with the violence he seems to be really hammering home a very specific type of masculine violence every time you see blood dr drawn it's for very very specific reason um violence is a incredible vital way that characters show dominance in this movie I mentioned before when young Madeline um 
jumps up with a rock and just starts swinging. Uh, it's she's again the girl of the movie, so she has to be extra badass than everyone else um, just to survive. And this just is not just with the kids or even with the grabber. This is just all through the movie. There's a particularly horrifying moment where a father is beating his daughter with a belt. And it's to show this very same reason. He's trying to set dominance over the family. And this belt comes up again. Even you see the grabber sitting with it, waiting to uh, wield out a very specific type of violence. Again, to dominate someone he wants to dominate well essentially he's a, a, how he dominates his victims is with a belt and for anyone who grew up in 50s 60s even probably 80s everyone uh knows that other implements we use to beat your children and the way it's used in this movie it's constantly a threat and it's you can almost hear the grip of the leather it's really well done and really really terrifying and that kind of goes into the kids they're beating the shit out of each other the parents are beating the shit out of the kids and the grabber is going around and just kidnapping kids and they're just disappearing and as i said because the way this movie's set up the grabber just kind of feels kind of normal except the fact that he's got this weird ass mask and he even though he will always plan to kill his victims, you're never really going to see him his full face, which I think is a really smart decision um, and a really creepy one. The grabber is not particularly fussy over the choices that he kidnaps. He goes from the quiet, invisible boys to the mulleted lunatics. Uh, they are a wide range of, of, of boys. All they have in common is that they're on the verge of manhood. It's kind of like, the grabber is trying to test his uh, his metal, his manhood against these not quite yet men. And these boys are having to prove their manhood by trying to survive the grabber. There's a lot entwined here that I don't quite know how to explain. Or I don't even, I think, but I think that is what the movie is trying to grapple with. It's not necessarily about the systematic abuse, but it is about how men communicate with each other. As I said, keep saying, beating the living snot out of each other. Which is why I think uh, Madeline's character is so important uh, to this movie because she is the one that is you trying to use other ways to to communicate. She is trying to go, hey, maybe we should search. Maybe we shouldn't beat the shit out of each other. Um, and by the way, her name's Gwen. It's Gwenny. It's Finny and Gwenny uh, throughout the throughout the movie. And this is just a small part of this movie. I mean, you also have the supernatural element, the element of memory, the element of dream and memory. The rules of the ghost are absolutely fascinating. I was not expecting to chew on the black phone as much as I did, and I'm still chewing on it a few days after I've seen it. It's a fascinating movie. There are so many different aspects you can dig into it, and I don't think I've touched even a big portion of what this movie is. And also it's a movie you can just, just sit down and enjoy because it's bloody tense. Um, and these sequences where you don't quite know how exactly they're going to play out. And he plays with your, and he really, Scott Derrickson's really playing with your sense of movie time. Oh, okay. I think this thing is things that maybe seem too early or too late in the movie. He's constantly doing as well as having a really strong three act structure movie. It feels really effortless, and it probably does help that Scott Derrickson is playing this very much in his dark wheelhouse. You have a host of really strong actors. He, they know how to get your emotions. I really can't recommend uh, The Black Phone highly enough. I think it's a real thrill, thrill ride of a movie. But more importantly, it's kind of a movie I think you might want to talk about after you've seen it, which is probably why I really wanted to do this review because I want to talk about it, and this is my way of doing it. But no, I recommend going and seeing the the, uh, the uh, Black Phone. I don't think I've spoiled it too much. I mean, the trailer does give away that this is ghosts. But there are some really amazing moments in this movie. And uh, let me know if you do see it. Let me know what you think of it. And uh, we'll be back with a, another double feature or another review. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.